Modern day archaeology offers compelling evidence about the characters and the events in the Holy Bible. Hello everyone, I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. Thanks for being with us. Well, did characters like David and Solomon really exist? Many historians today are divided over those questions, but today we'll meet two archaeologists who are digging up parts of David's life. And what they've found supports the biblical accounts down to the smallest details. Gordon Robinson takes us to the site of one of David's greatest victories, the Valley of Elah. Here in Jerusalem, his name is everywhere. David is the most famous king in Israel's history. But some say he wasn't the great ruler described in the Bible. One Israeli archaeologist said that David and Solomon did not rule over a big territory. It was a small chiefdom, very poor. This is a great chief. If you want to call King David chief or King Solomon a chief, this is a great chief and this is a huge tribe. <laughs> Others say he never existed at all. Even a professor of biblical studies who insisted, I am not the only scholar who suspects that the figure of King David is about as historical as King Arthur. These guys said, well, they didn't have any historical memories, so David and Solomon are pure mythological figures. One by one, those archeological memories are being uncovered. And all over Israel, excavators are confirming the biblical story of Israel's greatest king. The Bible records David's story in great detail, from his days as a shepherd boy to his death in the royal palace of Jerusalem. Today, you can walk in the same places where David walked, and they still have the same names as they did 3,000 years ago. There's Bethlehem, the place where he was born, and where he was anointed the king of Israel at just 15 years old. This is En Gedi, the desert oasis where David hid from King Saul in caves like this one, and Hebron, where he spent seven years as the king of Judah. For centuries, the Bible was the only written evidence that King David ever existed. There was no archeological record of his reign until about 150 years ago. In 1868, a stone tablet was discovered in Jordan. It was written by a Moabite king named Mesha, an enemy of Israel. The stone dates to around 840 BC, less than 200 years after David. And it contains the first known reference to the house of David outside the Bible. In house of David, it's mean dynasty of David. So we know that there was a guy called David and he created a dynasty. Okay, so this is now absolutely clear that David is not a mythological figure. The same phrase, House of David, turned up on another stone more than 100 years later, this time in northern Israel. It was written about 200 years after David's rule, again by one of Israel's enemies, Hazael, the king of Damascus. He said, I killed 70 kings. I killed, I killed a king from Israel and a king from the house of David. One of David's greatest victories took place here, in the Valley of Allah. This is where the young shepherd boy killed the giant Goliath. And it's one of the few places where you can still catch a glimpse of the Israel that David knew. Nearby are the ruins of the Philistine city of Gath, the hometown of Goliath, and the remains of the brook where David found the stone that killed him. High above the valley is a fortress that's thousands of years old. To the local Bedouin, this place is still known as Kirbet Daoud, or David's Ruin. It's the only Iron Age city in Israel that's perfectly preserved and almost frozen in time. 
For us as archaeologists, this is one of the richest sites in Israel. This is like a biblical Pompeii. The Hebrew name is Kirbet Kaiafa, or Fortress of Elah. Archaeologist Josef Garfinkel first uncovered the city in 2007. He recovered some burnt olive pits from the site and sent them to Oxford University for carbon dating. The results surprised even Garfinkel himself. Turned out that the dating of all these beautiful cities and all the find is from about uh, 1020 to about 980 BC. And this is exactly the time of King David. In David's day, the Valley of Allah served as a neutral zone between the Israelites and the Philistines. In Kaiafa, which was right on the front lines, excavators discovered a large cache of weapons. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. That we are in the same location, in the same time, and uh, the city is heavily fortified, we have all these weapons. So it's telling you that this was indeed a, an area of conflict between two political units. In the Bible, this fortress is mentioned with a different name, Shah Arayim, the city of two gates. In 1 Samuel 17, Shah Arayim is the place where the Philistines fled after David killed Goliath. Shah means in Hebrew, two gates. In Hebrew Kayafa, we have two gates. So if you take the biblical tradition, the location, the chronology, the meaning of the name, all these three aspects, you have fit Kayafa perfectly. Just 10 days after Kayafa was discovered, critics argued that it was a Philistine city, not a Jewish one. So Garfinkel went to work proving them wrong. What is the ethnic component of the city? I think that the city is Judean based on four arguments. His first argument is the city's design. We have a casement city wall and houses abutting the casement city wall. This is now from four other sites. So now we have five sites. All these five cities are in Judah. None of them is in Philistia. So this is really typical Judean urban planning. His second argument is the animal bones found in the city. All of them strictly kosher. We have sheep, goat, cattle, but we have no pigs and no dogs. And in Philistine sites, they consume pigs and also dogs. Up to 20% of the animal bones in Philistine sites are uh, pigs, but here nothing. Point three, this pottery shard, also known as an ostracon. It's the earliest example of Hebrew writing ever unearthed. On it are written commandments to worship the Lord and to help widows, orphans, and slaves. It started with the word al taas, which means don't do. And taas, uh, to do, is only in Hebrew. It's not Canaanite and not Phoenician. The absence of idols also points to a Jewish city. If you go to Canaanite temples of the late bronze, you will find in them a lot of uh, human and animal uh, figures, but not in uh, Chibet Kayafa. So the people here really obeyed the biblical taboo on graven image. There were no idols, but there were religious shrines. These models predate Solomon's temple by about 40 years. And yet they match the Bible's description of the temple, down to the triple frame doors. They're the first physical evidence of Jewish worship in the time of King David. It was not my mission to come here and to prove the uh, historical uh, authenticity of the biblical tradition. When I came here, I have no idea. And these are the results. These are the animal bones. This is the radiocarbon dating. This is the inscription. These are the fortifications. And then you have the biblical tradition. And what to do, they just happen to fit nicely to each other.